that so I think that's where we are is that we're both in love with one another in love with our relationship but not it's not the most important thing in our lives and that's not a bad thing it's a great thing Welcome to Normalizing Non-Monogamy, the podcast where we interview incredible people from across the entire spectrum of non-monogamy to hear their fascinating stories. We strive to bring guests on the show who have a healthy approach to non-monogamy. However, it's important to remember that everyone does it a little bit differently, and the views and opinions expressed by our guests do not necessarily reflect our own. Additionally, we produce this show for entertainment purposes only. Please be aware that we aren't doctors or therapists. Consult a medical professional for anything regarding your health that you might learn about on the show. Enjoy. Welcome to episode 88. We're Finn and Emma. And today we have our regular Wednesday episode. Uh, I mean, that was quite the surprise on Monday. I know. (laughs) We hope everyone enjoyed it. And now you get another episode this week. So today we have an interview with Eliza and Mark. Yes. Yes. And it's actually, you'll see, there's two parts to it, which we won't go into right this second. But um, Well, maybe we should give them a warning about what the second part is. Not a warning, but a heads up. The, the second part is a follow-up to the first part. Uh, and it's a really good conversation about what happens when you're diagnosed with an STI. And yes. And so... Uh, you're definitely going to want to stick around and listen to that because it's a really great conversation. And, um, yeah, we really appreciate Mark and Eliza coming back on to to talk about it. Yeah. And their story in general is fascinating. It's We're so happy that they were willing to come on and share. So Yeah, it's a great sort of discussion. I mean, the underlying theme through the whole thing is sort of how how different partners can fulfill different needs in your life. And it's a really... Oh, it's a it's a great conversation, and we're super excited about it. Uh, one quick thing to mention is that uh, we, as you can maybe tell, like the last maybe ten or twelve episodes, we've been like some episodes the audio is way better than others, and it's not that it was ever terrible, other than what that one person on iTunes thought. But <laughs> the well, are uh, you a little? Uh, I'm not. I'm no. I'm just no. I'm just taking notes. Um, but we're we switched over from using Skype to Zoom, and we're figuring out what the best way to use that is. And so, just give us a little bit of time here. We've got it pretty much figured out, and it, you should start hearing improvements. Yes, so we always th- strive. Thank you for your patience. Yeah, we always strive to bring you the best audio quality, but we are limited once in a while. Now, where we're going to be this week? We're leaving today. Yes, we're leaving today. We're headed towards New York City, and we will be there on October 3rd for our first meet and greet. That's tomorrow. Yes, it is. Woo! So if you want to come meet us and hang out, go RSVP on our website. Um, Also, we're doing a meet and greet in Boston on October 18th, and then again in Toronto on October 26th. So we will see you there. Yes, all information, details, RSVP information, all on our website under the events page. Go check it out. And if you can't make it in person, we will be having two back-to-back Patreon Q&As, video Q&As. So you can call in and see uh, Emma's lovely face. And you. And hear us talk to you about whatever questions you have. That will be October 16th at 9 p.m. Eastern and then again at 9 p.m. Pacific. So we're... We're trying to pick up everybody this time. Yes. And Um, I mean, I think at that point we should probably go talk to Mark and Eliza and we need to wrap it up because we're going to go get our STD testing (laughs) done right now. Yes, we are. We're going to do that this morning. And if you want to save $10 on your panel, go use the link on our website and you can use a service called STD Check. And we have love it. It's super easy and fast. You just... Um, you know, put the information online, go to your nearest lab court or quest lab, give donate your blood and urine, and then that's it. You get your results within I think 28, 24 to 48 hours. That's true. So it's super easy, and we're doing it this morning as we're also trying to move out across the country. So that's how simple it is. <laughs> that's true. Now let's go talk to Mark and Eliza. Liza and Mark, welcome to the show. Thanks for joining us tonight. Thank you. We're really excited to be here. 
yeah, yeah. and you reached out to us via email and actually wrote us a very lengthy story. Uh, at least you did, Mark. Which I don't do lengthy stories. No, you did not. <laughs> but, but it was amazing. We were actually reading it just about an hour ago in the car on the way over here. So reminding ourselves about what you said. So, but we have to forget everything. Start anew and start a start fresh here. Yeah. Well, for anybody who didn't read our email from you, <laughs> uh, do you do you two mind sharing a little bit about just brief background bio biography of who each of you are, and we'll go from there. Uh, so I grew up in the Midwest. Um, had a couple of years in Europe at different points growing up, and then after college, I bounced out to California. Flew hang gliders, rode motorcycles, waited tables and bushed dishes, tried to be an artist, failed, tried to write a screenplay, failed, came back to the Midwest, planned to get into art school again to try another shot at it because I'd failed the first time Mm -hmm. and uh, (laughs) wound up getting involved with Macintosh computer when it came along and fell into desktop publishing and then databases and then the web when it showed up and just kept kind of teaching myself as self as things came along and got married along the way, was married for about 15 years. Um, Then that just kind of ended no big blow up. Just my wife fell out of love with me. And so after a year or so of like trying to see if we could make it work, no, gave it up. So, yeah, so after about 15 years of marriage, we just kind of had drifted apart and wound up getting divorced amicably, and I set off to get uh, start dating again at 50, and uh, decided I wanted to do it better than I had when I was in my 20s, because I pretty much didn't date in my 20s, I didn't know how to do it was this geeky artist guy who did these strange things like hang gliding and, and it was not working as far as uh, getting Getting, relationships going. Getting chicks? Yeah, it was not Hang gliding didn't do it? Hang gliding did not do it. Go figure. Um, (laughs) (laughs) What the hell? Really? (laughs) Um, So I I, I got on online dating, OkCupid, started talking to people on OkCupid, and for the first 18 months or so, I was mostly just chatting with people, had a few dates. They were fun, but didn't go anywhere. But in the course of it, I started realizing, hey, I kind of like meeting people. I kind of like the excitement of meeting someone new and getting to know them and, and find out about them. And unlike when I was a kid in my 20s, dating was suddenly fun. And I was like, well, okay, I guess I'm not in a rush to get partnered up again. I also put on my dating profile that I wanted to just keep things open because I had children and I planned to stay around until they were launched and off to college, which was going to be another 10 years or so. And I didn't want that there were, wasn't, didn't seem to be anyone in my area. So I had to expand my dating radius out like a hundred miles to find people. <laughs> Indiana. Yeah, <laughs> Central Indiana. Uh, slim, it's, it's a uh, rough market here. Anyway. Um, <laughs> so how, how long ago was this roughly? It sounds like. Uh, this would have been 2009, about. So about okay. 10 years ago. Yeah. 10 years ago. Uh, okay. And so I put on my dating profile that, you know, hey, I just want to keep things open. I'm not really looking for a partner right now because I knew that I was going to be staying there. I didn't want people I was might be dating, you know, an hour or two away to think that if things went well, I might pick up and move there because I wasn't going to, I was going to stay in town where I could see my kids every day, every day or two. And that eventually led me to a very nice relationship with someone who was also in the same situation, felt the same way. And that kind of opened the door to the whole non-monogamous thing. It's like, ah, this really works for me. I, I like this. And so, that's how I got where I am. And so that's that's when you met Eliza after it was a it was a number of years though, right? Of yeah, actually, it was so, quite quite a few years before I met Eliza. This I, I, the first person I met who was happily non monogamous and kind of in the same boat uh, was someone else. Uh, I'm calling her Jane for this, <laughs> <laughs> uh, and uh, 
yeah, we were together for about two and a half years, and she is actually the person who kind of introduced me to swinging. She hadn't done it herself, but we started listening to SwingerCast and the old Swap Foo podcast, mm -hmm. and uh, thought it sounded pretty interesting, and eventually tried it out at a club a couple times, and said, yeah, this is fun, so. Yeah. And so you, so in the course of the last 10 years, you haven't really had a monogamous dynamic. Not at all. No. Ex explicitly non-monogamous. Yes. I've always okay. said, nope, I don't do that. Okay. And it sounds like it's taken on slightly different forms over the years. And it's, I guess now you're so, you're, even though you're partnered, you're solo, you both said you identified as solo Holly in the email and... Yeah, so that's good. before we go jump to your story, Eliza, I wanted to say, like, what, how do you two define your relationship at the moment? Um, I'm going to say that we are both, like, love our relationship. We are Absolutely. together. It's super important to both of us. Um, but it is not, and I think you would agree with me on this, it's not the most important thing in either one of our lives. And so I think that is what makes the difference between somebody who is, first of all, monogamous and polyamorous and especially solo poly like just the idea of like I have to be partnered with somebody like that does not that to me is like I can't stand that thought and I and I I actually my heart kind of breaks for women my age especially who feel that way like I have to have a partner I have to have somebody that I'm, I have to get married again I have to live with somebody again you know whether it's for financial reasons or romantic or emotional or mental reasons, whatever it is, I, to me, that is, I have to say I was married for 20 years and like the last five years of my marriage, I kind of felt like I don't really need this. You know, I don't need to be partners with somebody to raise my kids. Like yeah. I'm the one raising them anyhow. Right. And so, I mean, I, that, so, so I, think I think that's, that's where, where we are, are is, is that, that we're both in, in love, love with, with one another, another, in love with our relationship but not it's not the most important thing in our lives. And that's not a bad thing. It's a great thing. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I completely agree with that. Yeah. You have a lot of independence and ability to do your own thing, but yet value your time together and make it a priority too. Yeah. yeah. And we typically get together, you know, every other weekend or so. And that is just about perfect, I think. It, yeah. it, it keeps it fresh. So when we see each other, it's like, Hey, <laughs> tell me what happened to you in the last two weeks right. that you weren't able to text me, you know, and right. just, yeah. um, so stuff like that. Also, it leaves time for the other people in our lives, which is really nice, whether that is my family, my friends, my work, or my other boyfriends yep. or his mm -hmm. other girlfriends, you know, it leaves right. time. Now I would say, and I hate, I hate the term, but that we are sort of, what do you call it? Primary? Yeah. primary partners. I hate that term. It's, I hate it because it makes it, it sound like he's more important, but we've just been together for longer. Yeah. It, it's, it's descriptive, not prescriptive. Oh yeah. Good. Yeah. It yeah. describes the status quo, but it doesn't, it doesn't mean that it has to be that way. Right. It's, yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But it's, it's comfortable making that like you see, you've been together the longest you, you it's comfortable dynamic at the moment. Yeah. Right. And we have like our own routine. Every other yeah. week, yeah. somebody's going to somebody else's house. You know, yeah. we're going to make some dinner. We're going to drink some wine. We're going to, you know, do whatever. Have fun. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's like being an old married couple, but only every other weekend. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> awesome. Perfect. Well, and, and maybe that's a good segue into hearing a little bit of your background, Eliza, on how you, you touched on it briefly, how you kind of got here. But do you mind taking us through it a little bit more? So I grew up in Wisconsin, and as I told you earlier, I, um, I always dreamed of being a ballerina, and so I became one. And I did that for many, many years in Chicago, met my husband, my now ex-husband there. Um, we got married. I uh, stopped performing, but I didn't stop like teaching or choreographing. Had kids, really had, you can't be in a dance studio when you have an infant, and you have to you know, nurse that child. So yeah. um, kind of stopped doing that for a while. Uh, 20 years later, 
I, w- I found myself married to this man who was um, abusive. And um, I always thought to myself, well, I can handle anything. I can handle anything. But the minute it started getting down, my, my kids at that point were teenagers and were beginning to stand up for themselves. And he was just an asshole to them. And so I said, you know what? We're out of here. So I filed for divorce. We left. They were teenagers. They were basically able to say, Dad, we really don't, you know, we're going to hang out with you, but only on our own terms. And so that all worked out fine. So then I will tell you you that very sadly, sadly, at the age of maybe 48, 48, when I got divorced, divorced, I really thought I I was never going to have sex again. I'm not kidding. I'm not kidding. I mean, I had no no sex drive. drive. I didn't even have a fantasy. fantasy. I had nothing that turned me on. on. I had a vibrator that was collecting dust for five years. I mean, (laughs) it was just sad. And I didn't even think it was sad. I just thought, this is what happens when you get older. This is what happens. Like, this is supposed to happen. Right. Like, this is how all old people are. They're just sad, dried up little apricot vagina people. You know, I mean, just like the sad. So then about a year after my divorce, I remember my son coming home one night and saying, mom, you have got to find somebody to go hang out with, go find a boyfriend. So I got online and I found this man who reawoken me. I mean, it was incredible. Like the greatest sex I'd ever had in my life. And I have had a lot of sex in my life. Um, (laughs) But I, and he, at one point, so he was an artist And at one point, I thought he was, like, freaky enough that I could say, hey, I want to try this thing where you and I still see each other, but we also, like, see and date other people and get romantically involved with them as well. And he was like, whoa, what are you talking about? And here, I seriously, I thought I was, like, being this sort of pioneer. Like, nobody's ever thought about this shit before. Nobody's ever thought about having more than one ring and having it be okay with everyone. I mean, I thought I was, like, being, like, this totally cuckoo hippie pioneer. And then, so he he was like, no, I don't want to do that. We broke up briefly, and then we got back together. And in the middle of sex one night, he was like, I need to ask you something. And I was like, oh, my God, what? And he said, would you just please, can we just be monogamous and committed to one another for just six months and just see how it works? And I was like, <gasps> okay, okay, okay. I'm kidding you. It was like, it was so planned. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like oh, yeah. Asked that oh, yeah. question in that moment. So we did that. And then, crazy, I caught him cheating on me, cheating. And I was like, dude, this is what I wanted to do. Like, I wanted you and I to be able to have other people in our lives. So we broke up. Very sadly, he, so he was an artist. And very sadly, about maybe six, seven months later, he was hanging a show in Indianapolis and fell off the ladder and busted his head open. And they put him in a coma and he never came back. Whoa. Yeah. Yeah. That's horrible. I mean, I really thought, I mean, we did not end on great terms. So I really always thought some, you know, we'll be friends again because we had this great connection. He was a great guy, except for, you know, that shit. But, um, so then I'm online and I meet this guy and if you could see his okay Cupid profile, it is literally like, if you were to print it out, it would be like back, like double sided printout. Like 158 pages. <laughs> <laughs> I believe it. After the We've email. One of those yes, emails. these guys saw the email. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. So and so he's like, I'm like, he's you know, you always get asked that question. What are you looking for? What are you looking for? What are you looking for? Whenever you're on a dating site, and my thing was, well, I'll tell you what I'm not looking for. I don't want to get married again. I don't ever want to live with anyone ever again. So what I'm looking for is somebody who would just like put up with me, like seeing whoever I want and being okay with it. And you can do that too. And so we're talking about this super soon after he gets a hold of me. And I'm like, I, you know, like, I want this. I don't know if I can explain it. He's like, I think what you're talking about is solo polyamory. (laughs) So I go on Google it and I was like, Oh, holy shit. You people have been doing this all along. (laughs) I just didn't know it. (laughs) Nobody told me anything. So yeah, ever since then. So 
I guess backing up. So how many years ago were you divorced? About? Um, I think it's about six years ago now. Okay. And so then it's been the last six years, you've slowly been exploring this. And then how long have you two been together? Three years, a little over three. Three and a few three months. Yep. Okay, yeah. cool. Yeah. Just to give some context. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm curious. So you, you, you said slightly graphically, not that you had a lot of sex. I was curious, had either of you, and I know we're not, not focusing necessarily on the sex piece of it, but had either of you explored non-monogamy in your previous marriages at all, or was it strictly like... Or discussed it, or even had anything brought up about it. It was just assumed... Like when back, I, when, I was back in high school, when I was in high school, I remember saying to my I friends, saying to my friends, when I get married, I want, my own, married, I want my own bedroom. Like, won't it be like, super it be sexy super to have your own space and be like, hey, and be like, you want to sleep over tonight, <laughs> husband, husband, <laughs> you know? And so I really wanted that. And I think that there was a part of me that just wanted that autonomy and not to okay. always have to be freaking connected to somebody. Um, I will also tell you that until I met my husband, I never was in a, a, my longest relationship. I wasn't involved with somebody for a year, but before that, three months. Um, I also remember being told by a friend of mine, a guy friend of mine in high school, like, you are not meant to be tied down. And he didn't mean like BDSM. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I think you're right about that. Like, I, I don't know. I like variety and I like, I don't understand why we can't have lovers the way we have friends. You know, right. I don't understand why, why it has to be just one. And if it's not, then, oh my gosh, you're just a terrible person. You know, yep. And yeah. I um, had not ever had any experience of that sort at all. Um, when I was younger, I really wanted to find a partner. I was, you know, very, very desirous of having someone in my life who would be a, a partner for me. Well, and I also and, think culturally, when we back when we were younger, you were that's what you did. You got yeah. married and you had kids. Yep. Right. That's and it. I, and I, I, I took me a long time to do that, but I got there and I was really happy being married. I, I really enjoyed being a dad, being, you know, part of this partnership or whatever. Um, but we had really mismatched libidos and that was a problem. And I, I wasn't happy with that part, but it was okay. I, I can, I can deal, you know, this, this is all good other than that. So I can deal with it. And, I had lots of fantasies, but uh, did not ever even think about cheating or anything like that. It was like, okay, I just suck it up, and this is what it's going to be. Mm -hmm. But although I had no experience with non-monogamy, personally, I did have an exposure to the idea. And I think like a lot of people of my generation who are now have, have gotten into polyamory and so forth, the sort of gateway was Robert Heinlein's science fiction. Um, Moon is a Harsh Mistress, Time Enough for Love, Stranger in a Strange Land. There's a whole lot of these sort of free-floating, multi-connected, you know, uh, relationships in those books. Right. Mm -hmm. so, the, so the concept was there. Yeah, or I, I, and I always thought it was really interesting. I can remember having co conversations with my dad as a teenager about, you know, yeah, there's a book type, or The Moon is a Harsh Mistress, and these people, they're having, like, these different sorts of marriages, like, wine marriages, where people just keep, they just keep adding husbands and wives over time, and the whole thing just gets bigger and bigger, and, you know, generations, and uh, women with multiple husbands, and stuff like that. That seems like, makes a lot of sense, and he's like, yeah, uh, it's hard enough, That's hard science enough. Science fiction, son. Science fiction, it's hard <laughs> enough, you know, just keeping two people in sync. I can't imagine doing it with more people. Well, and what I think <laughs> is so interesting is that when he talks about being married and they ended up having different libidos, you know, I was talking about how I lost my sex drive. I mean, it probably, I think from a lot of couples that unless you do something right. like actively do something, you don't want to screw around with each other. You get this boring after a while. Right. And it's like yeah. same old, same old, like I know One this name. dick inside and out. I, I, uh, yeah. you know, I know what's going to happen in this bedroom and so to do things like... But there was a mismatch from the beginning, too. So, yeah. There was But, it, but <laughs> then that effect kicked in, and it got even more so. so. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and so I'm curious. You, you, you mentioned that your dad... Or the, the quote you just kind of like... Yeah. 
comically pulled out was that it's hard enough getting two people on the same page. Right. Have Have you found now that you're exploring solo poly that that's really not the issue, and maybe because you aren't looking for each of your partners to fulfill everything, but that you're able to get well, a piece of it from this person and a piece of it from this person. I guess, what is your experience with that at this point? So I have three additional men in my life. Um, Christian is the one that I talked about, talked to about sports and politics. I mean, He's a huge football fan. I'm a huge football fan. We were like texting each other. I remember one time he was in China and I was, he was like, what are they doing? And I was like, just stay on the phone and I'll talk you through the rest of the game. <laughs> Lovely, beautiful. He's a huge soccer fan. Um, yeah. And a, Went to Russia for so like go to all the World Cup he's games. He's been to every World Cup for like that in his adult life. Um then I have one who is, I'm a very, uh, like, love the arts. So I have one who takes me to the opera and to the ballet. And when I have Michael Feinstein tickets, I'm like, hey, <laughs> you want to go see? Like, I will toss it out to the rest of them and be like, who the hell is that guy? And he's like, oh, my God, yes. Are you serious? How'd you score those tickets? Um, <laughs> and then I have one who is super sort of, like, older and hippie and I don't know just something else I'll do like a whole different dynamic and then I get this one who has you know 158 page (laughs) 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 like cooks the most amazing food we have pie waiting for us after this so I do feel like there is like even just like logistically like logistically these men serve different purposes for me and i hate to put it that way but it's true it's absolutely true well different interests too yeah well and i think that really before you uh get into your point real quick but (laughs) sorry to cut you off Um, shut up for a minute (laughs) she's gonna talk i realized that's what i was coming across (laughs) i wasn't gonna do that no see but it demonstrates how what you just said was you know one person kind of fulfills different roles but it demonstrates that one person cannot fulfill all of the roles for one other person and and that's what you know in in monogamy or in one relationship you're expected to do that and it's just even people who decide to be monogamous that's great that's totally fine if you decide to do it but realize that it's there's one person can't fulfill all of those needs that's right and that's why you need like family friends you know girlfriends or guy friends or whatever it is you need those people around you as well and, yeah. uh, you know, I yeah. feel like I get that from the men that I also sleep with, which is really nice. And I get it from, you know, my family and friends. But it's just nice to have a man to see Michael Feinstein with. <laughs> yeah. You know? So- that isn't me. <laughs> <laughs> okay, now, sorry for interrupting you. Now, now you go. <laughs> oh, I was just going to say, I, I I don't have quite the stable that, that she does. <laughs> um, I... We're working on it. Yep. I occasionally, I occasionally see someone. I, I, I uh, uncharacteristically met a couple of women right in my town early this year and had a couple of dates with one, and then that, that kind of fizzled out. Um, and another one, we saw each other for a month or so, and she hadn't tried swinging before but was kind of interested in it, so we went to a couple of clubs, and it was reasonably reasonably successful she she had a good time but the problem was she's really introverted and not comfortable in crowds and it's not the best sort of um personality type to have for swinging you know you kind of want to at least in the club environment yeah at least, yeah i was gonna say <laughs> Um, right. anyway, she, uh, luckily she, uh, she found, uh, she, she was taking advantage of the open relationship and dating other guys too, found a guy who really seemed to click with her more. And so I said, Hey, great, go, you know, she was, she was going to focus on him. It's like, do that. That's good. And then just recently I, uh, met someone on okay Cupid and we've been going out a little bit and that seems to be going very nicely. So we'll see what happens there. Yeah. Well, on the, on the flip side of that question of now that you don't feel like you have to get everything from a partner out of one partner, do you ever feel like, I don't know if it's jealousy, but like 
that you still have this need to be everything for one of your partners or have you like, cause there's, that's sort of the, like the flip side to that is like, well, I expect everything out of my partner and then I should be able to provide everything to my partner or I want to, I don't want them to need something else. Do you still feel that? Or have you both sort of been able to let that go? Or maybe you never had that. I don't know. No, no. I, so one thing, um, first of all, I think because you don't expect your partner to be everything to you, you, I think that that really is something that takes the pressure off of you yourself. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah, okay, I, I am not going to Burning Man and he's not upset about that. I'm not, I, mean, I want to find somebody else for you to go to the club with. Not upset about that. Right. I mean, so that, so this is one thing that I've always thought about jealousy in, in our dynamic is that if I, if Mark is out with somebody else and I'm home alone and I know that they're out and I get those feelings of like, Ooh, uh, um, I immediately think to myself when I am out with Christian or Ben or Sam, and I know that he's not there with me, I know that he is supportive and that he is cool with it. And that makes me love him even more. Right. So more. just him being supportive right? so of me supportive seeing those other men me makes me love men. him even more. Makes me and so why would the and so opposite not be true? true? Like, why would he not love me more because I'm supportive of him seeing, you know, Lisa or Carol or Linda or whoever it is, Linda or whoever it is. Like, I'm not the only evolved one, you know, and, and to think that is arrogant. And so to, you know, that to give my partners the benefit of the doubt that they are as evolved <laughs> as I am, you know, as like woke, we're all, yeah. we're all sort of the same. Like we, you know, we get it. I don't know that that's going to work in other dynamics. I don't know that that's going to work in a, in a swinging dynamic. I don't know that that's going to work necessarily even in a polyamorous dynamic, but for solo polyamory, I think that that is how it works. Like mm -hmm. I, this is how I work. And I expect you, you know, I know you the same way. Yeah. Right. Well, and it's interesting because I think it's, I don't want to say easy, but it's easier. Let's say, right, that, that Mark doesn't want to go see Feinstein. So for him, that's, for him, that's easy to be like, oh yeah, take, take anybody to that as long as I don't have to go. Right. But if it's something that he wanted to do or, a, or a piece of you that he feels that he should or he wants to fulfill, like that's where it kind of gets a little harder. And you, you kind of spoke to that, like go to Burning Man. I don't want to, and you said this before we talked, so I'm not putting words in your mouth that you don't want to go see naked hippies in the dust. <laughs> exactly. Not, her words, not mine. <laughs> my words, I swear on my words. <laughs> uh, so like for you, like that's an easy one, but like you said, it's the hard ones are when you're sitting at home, you don't have anything going on and you know, he's out having fun. Or, and maybe doing something that you would enjoy doing with him right. or vice versa. Have we ever had that situation? I don't know that we have. I mean... First of all, I'm going to tell you something. That I am a very big... I'm not an introvert in many ways, except that I need time to recharge. And I need solitude. And so for me, there are lots of times when he'll be like, hey, you want me to come down? I'll be like, no, I don't want to talk to anybody. I'm going to just like watch Netflix and drink wine and... Yeah. yeah, so I don't think yeah. that that... Not really. I mean, uh, uh, there have been times when you've gone out with, with folks and I'm like, fine, you know, because I'm doing my thing and I, I'm I'm very much the same way. And I that's, that's <laughs> as my understanding, that, that is kind of the definition of an introvert. It's not, it's not so much whether you like to be with people, it's what do you need to do to recharge? Yeah. You know, when, when, you know, how do you get your energy? Do you get your energy by going out and being with people or by going home and just relaxing and chilling. And, yeah. and I'm, I'm the same yep. way. I'm, I'm very social. I like being with groups of people and, and friends and so forth. But when I've done that, I need to go home and just sit down, read a book, watch Netflix. And I, I will also tell you that there is, in our dynamic, there is, at, at Mark at least, always makes an effort to include my other men. So, for instance, one of the greatest days of my life, um, was that two years ago, Valentine's Day? Yeah. Valentine's Day, either a year or two years ago. 
like the Saturday before. He had sent me a text like a month before saying, I'm, I've got a surprise for you the weekend before Valentine's Day. So be prepared. And I was like, what? What? And I'm actually talking to all of my other men about it. Like, oh, he's got a surprise for me. He's got a surprise <laughs> for me. Um, he ends up, so I'm talking to Christian, like texting me. He's like, well, what are you wearing? What do you think is going on? All right, text me pictures of the outfits you're bringing. And so he comes and he picks me up. We get in his car. We drive to Indianapolis. I'm like, I have no idea what is going on. We check in at the Alexander Hotel. I open the door and I walk in and I'm like, oh, there's a man in here. <laughs> because he had fl- Christian had flown in to meet us. Total shock and surprise. Like the best surprise I've ever had in my life. I haven't seen him in a long time. He actually lives in um, Maryland, Washington, D.C., and Florida. Mm-hmm. And I hadn't seen him in months. And so he flew up to have Valentine's Day with Mark and I. I went out and I picked him up at the airport and brought him to the hotel. Oh, my God. And he's texting me the whole lot. time, like, oh, what do you think the surprise is? And I was like, <laughs> oh, my gosh. Are you kidding And they're me? together the whole time. They were together the whole damn time. Well I, well, I was in the car with her while she's texting with him. He's in the hotel <laughs> waiting for us. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Yeah. So, I mean, there's... They're also, my, my porch is a little bit famous for all of my boyfriends meet each other on my porch. Like, they've all met. And, you know, once in a while that turns into a sex thing. Sometimes it doesn't, though. And most times it doesn't. But, like, it's, it, it's, it's an easy thing to do if everybody is just cool with it. You know what I mean? And nobody yeah. is worried about what they're not getting. Yeah. And, and that's kind of where we are and i'm she, she has really good taste in men apart from her ex-husband yes and i i i absolutely love all of her other boyfriends they're such cool people and it's just a great time to hang out with you know her yeah. and them and chat talk about things we do i feel like it's like being with my best friends you know yeah. like the dear the yeah. dearest friends you've ever had whether they're from college or high school these are my the men that i hang out with now are like that yeah. for me so, you have sex with them. <laughs> so, no, I, was, I will say. Okay, I, just, so that's no un, I mean, that's awesome. Like, that it's just both of you are in a spot where it's like your your surprises to each other can be each other's partners and that that doesn't, it's not a competition with her boyfriends to see who can get more time. And it's it's just a, let's all let's all be happy. There's no reason to like beat each other down to make yourself look bigger. Right. Right. That's exactly, so. exactly right. Exactly. And I will tell you, I think that part of it is because I'm solo polyamorous. There is no fucking prize. There is no bride. There is no housemate. There are no children. There's no tax returns. You know, there is no prize. There's nothing to win except for, you know, your own like good feelings and doing fun things and hanging out with, you know what I mean? There's no, so there is no competition because the prize has been taken out of it. Yeah. Not yeah. that I consider myself a prize, but oh, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> well, like, I was going to say the, the prize is like getting married, or I'm the one. Or, yes, yeah, yeah. right. Well, the the prize would almost be spending time with you, and and the people who are going to get to spend time with you are the ones who can be adults about it and not try to beat each other, beat your other boyfriends out of the picture to get more time with you. That's not. That's clearly not how to win more time. And it, yeah. it, it, it has a, it has occurred to me, and I don't know if this is true or not, but it, it seems to me as though it may be easier to take this approach and have this sort of point of view uh, at the point of life that we're at now. I totally agree. Where we have had a marriage, we have kids, mm-hmm. we're not looking for a partner to have kids with. You know, it, it's like that's that's all behind us. And now it's just like, okay, what do we want to do with our time now? Yes. Yeah. So, I totally That was actually going to be my question because I, if you were, you know, 20, 30 years ago, do you think you would be in the same place? Like, it, do you wish you would have got this relationship dynamic back then? Or, I mean, obviously, I know, you, like, of course you love your kids and you, I'm glad that they're there, but like, would you be searching for someone like to settle down with, have kids with, and on that path? If I mean twenty or thirty years ago, yeah, I would I would have been looking for someone to have kids with because I always I always knew I, I wanted to have kids. I wanted to I wanted to be a father and have that experience. 
I also wish that I had known about this relationship dynamic back then because I might have found a different way to go about having a family. Like one of the one of the women I met when I was on OK Cupid, and we've never met in person. Um, don't really talk anymore now, but for a while we were chatting all the time. She had a really interesting story in that she her she was getting older, later thirties or something, and she wanted to have kids. And there wasn't anybody sort of that she'd met who seemed like a good candidate to be a father, you know, or that, that seemed to be going that direction. She had an old boyfriend who was quite a bit older than her, but she knew that he'd always wanted to have kids. And so she got in touch with him and said, hey, I want to have kids. Do you still want to have kids? If so, what if we co-parent? We have some kids and we co-parent them. We're just not a thing together. And he was like, yeah, okay. So I think, I think if I remember correctly, the story correctly, they actually like wrote up a contract about who, you know, specifying the support for the kids and how this was all going to be handled. They bought a place together. This was on like some island out in the Seattle area or something. Of course. Of course. Of course. Yes. <laughs> um, <laughs> so I think it was Seattle, but anyway. Um, and so they had this old house. They all lived, they, they lived there. They had two kids, two boys, I think. And as the boys got older, they started building a little compound. They, they each of the boys had their own little separate hut or some, or you know, <laughs> building away from the main house. And then there was another one. So the main house was kind of like the communal space, and mm-hmm. they would she and the guy would have their own bedrooms there most of the time. But and the boys had their own little rooms. And then they had this other outbuilding that they called the fuck shack. So when they had when they had guests come over, one of them they would just go down there, you know, and that was where they'd stay with their guests. <laughs> See, super <laughs> so that, interesting, And, so and, and it works. I mean, yeah. it's it, it. they did a great job. And you know what? Yeah. I'd love to meet those boys now. And just know, like, like say, were you, you know, like, did you even have any idea this was going on? Did you have any idea how unusual the setup was? And, if, you know, or did you, were you like, yeah, but it was... I don't know. They, they were they were homeschooled for at least a good part of it, so they may not have had a, oh. the uh, the the, like the perspective of, yes. of, of of the rest like, of the, the like society. Like a football team calling your mom a big slut. Like yeah, yeah. That, <laughs> that was not happening. Well, maybe maybe that's a, a segue into uh, do any of your kids or families know about your relationship dynamics since since you've. And if they, divorced, do, if yeah. they do, how do they feel about it? What is their response? So my, uh, first of all, both my kids know. I raised my kids to be very, very, very sex positive. I mean, I don't think they keep anything from me. They could. And even then, I'm like, that's cool. You got to have your own secrets, too. Um, so my kids both know. Um, I remember the first time I was ever away with, Mark and Christian in Chicago. My daughter texted me and I was like, Hey, I'm with Mark and Christian in Chicago. And she's like, Oh, you go mom. <laughs> and was like, it's not as kinky as it sounds, dear. But um, she, so my kids know my kids are super cool about it. We've talked so much about, I have told my kids over and over again, you do not have to get married. You don't have to, if you want the big party, I will throw you a big fucking $10,000 party. If you want to have kids, I will help you raise your kids, whatever it takes. I don't want you to get married because you feel like you have to get married in order to like fulfill adulting, you know? Yeah. And so, um, my kids are totally cool about it. My mom, I've told her, my mom is a widow and, um, is just came back from a two day holiday in Paris with her 84 year old boyfriend that she met on match. So she's cool. <laughs> she's totally cool about it. She really is. They, all of my family members have met Mark and they adore him. A few of my family members have met Christian. Um, I, both my kids have met um, Ben and Steve as well. So they, my kids have met all of them. Um, my sister though, which is so weird to me because she's younger than me. Is, has turned into like this big prude. Like, how can you do that? Like, how can you not get, je- don't tell me you don't get jealous. I'm like, well, everybody tends towards, you know, when I go through the whole thing about it makes me happy. It makes him happy. Blah, 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 blah. Like how many times do I have to say this? Oh, you know, you, you just haven't found the right person yet. 
<laughs> I'm 54 years old. You found four. You found four of them. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Like, yeah, I've done, you know, rich and handsome. I think I'm just going to do like what I want now. And yeah, yeah. So my family's, my family is absolutely cool with it, except for my sister. But then we just, my mom and my kids give her a hard time. (laughs) But but they all know about it other than just, sounds like she's got a case of the jellies. She's a little (laughs) jealous of what you got going on. A little bit. She's in those years where she's raising now um, a grade school child and she and her husband are working their asses off just trying to get by. And I'm sure that it does, you know, I'm half the year. My kids aren't even here. I live alone. I don't have to make anybody waffles for breakfast. You know what I mean? So I think other than the is... three guys that stayed over. <laughs> right. <laughs> Except and then, then I'd be making breakfast. So. Yeah. I was going to say, yeah, that's his, I that's his job. So, that's... so don't even look at me. <laughs> yeah, she that's does a pretty it. sweet setup. Uh-huh. This, this, this is a, a bit of a sticking point with us. She never eats breakfast. No, and this is a nice thing too. Like all my other boyfriends, no, they like breakfast. Nice thing they go out for like breakfast together and I stay in bed. They go out for breakfast together and I stay in bed. It's perfect. So my kids, I don't know why everybody doesn't do this. <laughs> no, I'm telling you. Um, my kids, uh, I've never, I'm, I, I haven't been quite as uh, sort of sex positive and open and talking about that with them as uh, Liza has. But they, I have, as they've gotten older, I've just been a little more open about things. It was, I was like, you know, oh, yeah, my friend's coming over and so forth. And now I'm, I'm leaving books out, you know, that are about polyamory and stuff. And, and they know that I'm seeing different people and so forth. I've never mentioned swinging to them. So I don't know about that, but yeah. um, my dad and my dad, I've talked to about non-monogamy. I can't remember whether I've actually talked about it specifically with my sisters. I don't think they would you know, have some serious problem with it, but I don't know that we've really gotten into it in the past. It hasn't come up. Yeah. I mean, I think it's it's fascinating, right? Because we talk to a, quite a few people who are younger, and then you talk to people, you know, in their mid-50s, late-50s, and it's like, what what are people worried about with you? It's not like you aren't taking... You, you're, you're obviously mature enough at this point. I mean, I don't know what, what people would be concerned about. I, I don't know. Right. So even if we're making really stupid decisions at this point, we are affecting nobody but ourselves anymore. Right. I mean, like, it's not like, yeah, like my right. kids are never even around anymore. When they are, they're down in the basement making yeah. their right. own bad decisions. And, you know, so I, yeah. Yeah. I, I'm with you. Like, that's how I feel about my sister. Like, why do you even care? Like, right. wh- who cares? Yeah. Exactly. You know, I'm not well, hurting somebody, anybody is my big thing. As long as I don't hurt anybody, I can do whatever I yeah, want to do. Yeah. 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 So I'm I'm curious on, on a subject that we, we do bring up most episodes, but I like so one thing we have heard, and this is in no way to insinuate that either of you belong in a retirement home. But we, <laughs> I, I promise I'll get there. <laughs> Whoa. I'm getting there. But we, we, I have heard that. that I can't that wait to hear this. Of, All right, I'm, I'm going to do a jack palance and drop and do do 50 push ups right now. Just to... <laughs> That's right. No, you got you both, You're both. I mean, yeah. All right. Okay, so the, the topic of, of STDs and STIs in the, the communities where people aren't worried about getting pregnant and aren't worried about all these other things are much higher because they don't think they need condoms. Or yeah. No, no, no. no. Yeah. Condoms all the way. Yeah. My, right. so my sister actually does work with the elderly community. And that was one of her things is like, everybody's getting, you know, herpes now because everybody can, like men can pop a pill and get hard and go screw around and, that has changed like everything. And so I totally get that. I totally get that. And and this is a discussion I've had with my mother. Like, mom, she's like, but we're monogamous. I'm like, yes, but you weren't. This is not the only man you've ever slept with in your life, mom. You guys have got to, like, get tested and be careful. And I'm sure she did not get tested. And I'm sure he does not wear a condom. But I've tried. Right. Um, well, and, and I think that was exactly my, my question, like, because you've now both been in the dating world in your 50s. And I guess how, how is it like what, what, what is what, like, how, what is yeah. that discussion? Maybe right. is how, that, how, is it, does it exist? If it does, we obviously assume it does. But 
what how are people handling it uh for myself he just comes with condoms he I, just I, he, I, he will not, not yeah no I, I i always if i'm going on a date i bring condoms and i just assume that we're going to use them and, and i i don't do any penetrative sex without condoms um <laughs> In fact, yeah. after three years together, we just recently decided, eh, okay, we'll we're good. We're good between us two. Yeah. But everybody else, yeah, if it's penetrative sex, it's condoms, not oral sex. Yeah. But yeah, um, yeah, yeah. No, there's always a level of risk you're taking, right? You're, yeah. Everyone's taking. Oh, for sure. I get I get yeah. tested typically once a year because that's when insurance will pay for it, and with my physical and so mm-hmm. forth. And I figured. Tests are something that you should do periodically just to find out if there's something that you have aren't aware of. But yeah. as as, as I've heard people say on your your podcast before and other podcasts and and Dan Savage and all that, you know, it's really only good the day you get it, and right. not even necessarily totally accurate then because maybe something's incubating that hasn't quite shown up, ready, you know, shown up on the test. Sure. Yep. But but again, that's still not a reason to be like, well, I'm never getting tested then because, you know, it's not, and that's not obviously what you said. I'm just, right. but, yeah. I, I'm but not, no, I'm, oh, go ahead, sorry. we're not, I think either of us in the group of people who say, oh, I'm not going to have sex unless you show me your test results, you know, right? Yeah, because it really doesn't matter. Because that here's, much. I mean, here, here's the other thing too, really, if, are you going to have sex with somebody you can't trust? Right. right. You've, if it's somebody that you don't, like you feel like oh, he's kind of giving me the squeebies. Do you even want to fuck that person? Yeah. I don't. Like I right. don't want right. to. You know, if it's somebody who I think is like trying to be deceitful. Yeah. I, I don't. I not only do I not want to have sex with you, I don't even want to make out with you. Like I don't even want to like hang out with you. So that's yeah. going to be yeah. You know, and I might be a little bit naive and be maybe trusting, but I do feel like the men that I see. And I've got a good, like my instincts are good about whether they are. Well, and I think it's also, it sounds like, right. You're not in a, in a situation of desperation, right. Where you're like, well, I haven't gotten any in four years. I'm really <laughs> pent up. And but like, I I'll just, you like know, that. I was like that. <laughs> I totally was like that and just happened to meet a person. But even then we used condoms. <laughs> right. But yeah, I mean, I think did, well, did your out has your, your ability, not your ability to filter people, but like you're, are you more selective now than you were when you first started? Because you've kind of realized that if this one doesn't work out, it doesn't really matter. There's going no, to be another one. No, I, I would say actually, if anything, I'm probably more selective now. Um, right, I, right. Oh, I'm yeah, sorry. I'm more selective now. Just first of all, because yes, I have an assortment. I have a little collection. <laughs> <laughs> it's like a troll doll collection. But I have, I have men in my life. Who are? I mean, I I have, don't remember the last time I was on Tinder or OkCupid or Plenty of Fish or anything because I'm just so content yeah. and at peace with where I am right now. And once in a while, I'll hop back on and go out on a date with somebody, and I feel disingenuous doing that. Like, am I really going to make room for one more man in my life? And um, am I, you know, do I really want to do that? I'm telling you that I am the luckiest woman on the face of the earth because I met this guy. And then like three weeks later, I met Christian. And then maybe about three weeks after that, I met Steve. And then at the artist's funeral, I met, what am I calling him? Ben. Ben. Yes. <laughs> yes. Um, so I met all these men in quick succession who were of like mind I mean, who said, no, this is how I do things too. And I was like, are you kidding me? Like how, like, what is the universe do converging on my forehead right now? I, so I just feel like, you know, I, I, I have gone out on a few dates with a few other people and once in a while, like I have some out of town boys that pop in they're like, hey. just got me in, t- just got in touch yeah, again with like, what's hey. his name. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Do you want to come but the, and so those but the bars, but the bar's a lot higher now, right? Because yes. you found that you can do it well. You don't need to settle for every time you go out on a Tinder date that you have to get some. Yeah. 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 And I, I would say my bar is higher too, although I do I am on all the different dating apps regularly. I mean every day I'm checking them. Because I don't have 
as I said, the stable that she does, I've got a couple of people I've seen. Right now, I've got one other person that I'm dating. And, sure. Um, this is why we're so looking I, for. We're looking for girls. Right. Advertisement right here. <laughs> this is why. Central Indiana. I don't have a SoundCloud, but. <laughs> um, so, yeah. So I, I, have, I have more availability than she does for additional connections and I would like to fill that. Um, plus the, I'm, I'm also aware of the fact that unless you are constantly going out and expanding your social network, whether it's romantic or just friends, it will inevitably contract because people drift away. People move away. People have a problem with you and cut off communications or something Inevit or they die as you get into you know mm-hmm. older older uh, parts of life. I'm not there yet. Um, <laughs> I know I can't oh, believe I can't believe Emma know. said you guys were going to the old folks. <laughs> um, so I, I, I think it's really important to be putting a little bit of effort all the time into trying new things, looking looking for new ways to connect to people reaching out and, and saying hello to people. Mm-hmm. And, and because if you don't do that, inevitably your social circle is going to contract and that's not a good thing. It's good to, to have a broad network. Yeah. And have you found other ways besides the, the online dating world to like some other ways you would recommend people that are coming out of marriages after 20 years or think that, well, and because we get, we do get these emails quite a bit where like, people are how like, do we "Oh, meet people? yeah, I'm I was married forever, and you know, I'd love to get into swinging, or I'd love to get into poly, but it's too late for me now. I'm I'm past that." And first there, thing, uh, it's not too late, definitely. Secondly, uh, apart from the apps, I don't know. Uh, like in in where I live, the little modest sized city in, in Indiana, there is a polyamory meetup group, and if someone said, "How do I get?" How do I start meeting people like this? I would say go to that. You know, you might not meet somebody that you connect with romantically, but maybe they've got friends. Maybe you get to know them. You get to know their friends, and maybe one of their friends is someone that you yeah. might get along with. One thing about that, though, is that it is going to – it's definitely younger people. Yeah. We're going to be the oldest folks there. Yeah. I mean, so I'm, you almost have to, I think, as – a certain a person of a certain age who wants to, to you know start exploring this type of life you have to you're going to have to get used to that like being the oldest person in the room yeah. you're just going to have to get used to it i mean that is it you know what i notice at the swing clubs we are definitely not the oldest ones there at all yeah. um but when it comes to things like you know the polyamory uh talk rooms on um, Facebook, we've got a solo polyamory group on Facebook. We're old <laughs> in there. <laughs> yeah, and it's very young sort of like I always make fun of like they all have like long hair and pet <laughs> lizards and you know like really like sword collections and like really like you guys being polyamorous is weird enough. You don't have to like <laughs> Take it to the next level. (laughs) (laughs) But seriously, like, I do feel like we are the old, always kind of the old people in the room. At one end of the bell curve. Until somebody else your age shows up in there and is looking for someone to commiserate with that is also, I mean, that's, so you, you aren't going to meet the people unless you're out there looking. Yeah, this is the bottom line is show up and be places. You got to show up. And that's, that's, that's why I check, like, okay, I'm on. Tinder, Bumble, Hinge, OK Cupid, Coffee Meets Bagel, and I check all of them every day just because I, I got a I don't even, Two of those I've never even heard of. <laughs> <laughs> That's because they're old people apps. Probably. <laughs> hey, if, they're, if, if they're apps, they can't be that old. <laughs> what was it? Coffee Meets Bagel? Coffee oh, Meets Bagel, yeah. That's a yeah. really old one. I, I, I hate that thing, but, you know, I, I have met a couple people through it, so it's like, all right, I'll do this. I will tell you, too, that one of the men that I see is married. They're in an open relationship, and she is lovely, amazing. Like, we'll text every now and then. Once in a while, she'll send me a text like, hey, I'm going out of town, just letting you know. And <laughs> But they're in their 40s. So they're younger than us. 
And um, I know that they do a lot of the apps. They go to clubs. Um, they both have separate OkCupid okay accounts, and they also have um, like they they how can you do that? Like hook them to one another. Yeah, you can link. They link to one other link to one, one other another. Yeah. Um, yeah. So and they, you know, forties and definitely not like. With a pet, I mean, they actually do have a lizard now that I think about it. <laughs> but they're not like, like, they're the most, like, middle American. You, If you were to see them, you'd be like, well, these guys? Really? I mean, they're just so vanilla looking that you right. would not even for one second believe that they are, you know, yeah. doing the things that they are doing and enjoying it and really, you know, doing the loving it yeah yeah well i mean maybe also also brings up another question i guess is is age even an issue for either of you like if you yeah. match with somebody who's 10 15 20 years younger does that matter or or older I or guess. older yeah uh, um i i rarely see people older who i would go oh yeah i want to match with them um yeah. sometimes it happens um but uh, younger, I, because I'm not looking for a life partner anymore, I'm not looking for, you know, to couple up with someone. Or to have more kids. Or to have more <laughs> kids. Yeah, God definitely forbid. right. Yeah. Yeah. You still can. I was going to say, that's so perfect. But I don't want to. <laughs> I can't afford it. Um, because that's been taken out of the equation, I'm, I'm happy to consider going out and, and having a relationship with someone who's significantly younger than me. Um, I got to admit that I tend to prefer people who are closer to my age just because we have a more of the same outlook, more, you know, common experiences. No, the so same forth. bands. <laughs> yeah. <right. laughs> um, yeah. Just kind of cultural milieu kind of yeah. reasons. Yeah. Yeah. But it's easy. It's easier to, yeah. You have a lot more to talk about with people that are well and mark though you have to remember is like a burner guy so all of his burner friends are in their 20s 20s or 30s early yeah, 30s early 30s if they're the old ones yeah all my like the all decrepit my... ones are 32 um so he is kind of the papa of their <laughs> camp but uh -huh. i mean they're lovely beautiful people and i'm sure if you ever got the chance to have a like a romantic relationship with one of those people who really kind of got you on that level you would say yeah okay. yeah totally yeah um for me um i'm 54 ben is 67 and i always had a thing for older men Always. When I was 25, I dated 50-year-olds. I just, I was like, it was like super hot for older guys. Um, and now, like, I feel like my age, finally, I'm like dating the men of, that I've always preferred my entire <laughs> life. So even Ben is a little old for me, but uh, yeah. So he's 67. Steve is, I think, 43 now. Um, so that's Spread. Yeah, <laughs> 20, like I didn't even think about that till right now. Like, wow, <laughs> <laughs> I've got a couple of the generations <laughs> in bed with me. Um, I don't know. I know, you know, I there is one man that I in, am in touch with. I think he's in his late thirties. You know, we have great we have a great time when we're together. It's very it's it's sporadic. That was just a silly little thing, but um. I don't know. Like, you get on OkCupid, okay and I don't know if you are on any dating sites, Emma? <laughs> Not really at the moment, no. no because but... you get, like, the craziest shit as a woman. Like, you get, yes, I mean... in the past. <laughs> I was getting things at the age of 52 from 19-year-old boys, you know? And, and, like, and this was before you could keep somebody from actually messaging you. So you could say, you know, what I would see, but that didn't keep them from seeing you. So they could message you and be like, will you take my virginity? Like, what? <laughs> Are, you Are you kidding me? Like, no, no, I won't. Please don't even contact me again. But there are, I mean, this is. Yeah. I would be so a little it curious. Is, I think it's, it's a, such a different world online for women than it is for men. 
Oh Very yeah, so. you just and get when approached we, we by have everybody, everybody if you are a girl. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and you don't get approached by anybody if you're a man. I mean, no. it's just the way it is. Especially not if you're a 59 year old guy balding and yeah. all that. So, um, yeah, that's oh shit! I just ruined my my advertisement here. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so I wow. I'm I don't know that I would go much younger than nineteen. Than ni- the nineteen. Yeah. Like forty. Forty seems yeah. reasonable. Yeah. 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 Cool. How about any funny instances or like a blooper that has happened in to either one of you that you'd want to share? You have permission. Sexually related or not. It, it doesn't have to be just, sexually related just, since we know your kids are planning to listen. This is so, at one point, I remember sitting in my, I live in a really old house, sitting in my kitchen. It was winter. I was like making soup or something, texting with this one. And he's like, oh my God, I've totally been communicating with this really beautiful woman on like Fat Life or something. Wasn't that what it was? No. Something it was, with, it was kick. And we, we, we met on. Um, it wasn't kick. No, no that's not Swing, li- swing Lifestyle. That's swing Lifestyle. Okay. okay. Yep. Yes. So I, I was like, oh, and days. he was like, oh, I'm just so excited. I think we're going to set something up, blah, 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 blah. And I was like, oh, send me a picture of her. What does she look like? I get a picture of her labia. <laughs> <laughs> I and I was like, are you fucking kidding me? And he was like, I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, so I said, Mark, we have to talk because first of all, if somebody is asking you for pictures of me, please tell me you are not sending them pictures of my vagina. <laughs> and so he, like, I was seriously like considering, like thinking that it was going to be a picture of like her with her cat, you know, like, look how cute yeah. I am with me like and my cute. kitten. It was, it was her with her pussy. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, that was a big blooper as far as, and, and at that point I had, I had, was talking to Christian on the phone. I was like, holy shit, he's sending me pictures of other women's vaginas when I'm asking for a picture. And he's like, I think maybe he thinks of you as more of a friend now. Like, he's like, he needs maybe some guy friends now. (laughs) But I was like, oh, wow. Yeah, that was, that was something. So that... It was a learning, a teachable moment. It was totally teachable. And it was handled with grace and humor. But, um, yeah, that's when, that's when seriously, as a woman, you start thinking to yourself, what pictures am I sending to people? And <laughs> yeah, am I sending them to sure. people that I trust enough yeah. not to do this bullshit? <laughs> I <Yeah. laughs> like, well, and, and I did not see your face. Mind, that's for sure. Right. There was to no be, face. To be, to be fair, there was no face <laughs> in it. Was and this was, say, picture, like, this was a picture she had on the website. Yeah, she was sharing it with others on the website. But, oh my gosh, I was just like. Holy crap. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So that's I, hilarious. I, I learned <laughs> at that point. <laughs> and we had a we had a good good communication going from about that. Yeah, yeah. Um mine uh I don't know, mine maybe was just my whole first swing club experience with uh the woman Jane that I was seeing for a few years shortly, you know, way back in my, the start of my polyamorous career. Um, this was, ooh, what, um, 2012, I guess. Uh, I had a friend who worked, he was an advisor in some office in, at the White House during Obama's first, um, administration. Yeah. And yeah, he'd yeah. always told me that, <laughs> right. A oh, moment of silence. I know. Oh. I know. I know. <laughs> God. Um, and he'd always told me that you know one of the perks of his job was he could he could get friends a tour of the West Wing and you could see the Oval Office and all that stuff. I was like, cool. So at, after Obama got reelected, he's like, all right, I've been in Washington for a couple decades now or something. I've got to get out of here. This is just too much. So he was gonna he was gonna quit. I was like, oh shit, this is uh, this is my chance. I got to do this. So. Jane and I decided we'd do a road trip out to DC and we'd get the tour of uh, the Oval Office for my friend. So we drove out there and stayed with him. And on the, while we were getting ready for this, she suddenly hit me with this thing and said, Hey, you know, we've been listening to these swinger podcasts and 
there's a club in DC. Would you want to visit it? And I was like, uh, I've never done that before, but sure, let's do that. So the evening of the day that we were seeing the Oval Office, then the evening we were going to go out to this swing club. The only problem was that it was a club that was sometimes BDSM, sometimes swing, and they alternated. And unfortunately, the only night we could go was that night, and that was a night when it was a BDSM club instead of a swing club. And we're like, oh, what the hell? Let's let's go see what it's all about. Yeah, um, yeah. fun. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Why not? So we did that. And we both of us were on a real budget at the time, so we're trying to do this on the cheap. And we were staying way over the river and, you know, quite a ways away. And we didn't even consider doing a taxi. We're like, you know, checking metro and bus schedules. We're like, well, there's a bus that stops. In like your BDSM clothes? No, 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 no. no. We're, we're dressing <laughs> up in, 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 what, in, in what our idea of a club clothes were. I think I had a suit on and, and she was in a dress or something, you know. So we found there was a bus stop a couple blocks away that would, you know, take a bus all the way right to the door, practically, like a block away. So like, great, we'll do that. So we jump on the bus, drive out there. And when the driver drops us off, they're like, okay, um, I just want you to know if you're going back on the same bus, this, you can't get picked up here. You've got to go several blocks back. And she told us where, you know, I was like, oh, okay. So we go to the club. And we look around, and there's all kinds of interesting stuff going on, but it's not really our thing. And so after about an hour, we're like, all right, that's that's probably enough. And we head out, and we're in our club clothes. We're walking to the bus station, uh, bus stop, and I'm looking around, and I'm going, this is a really sketchy, sketchy neighborhood. <laughs> I'm feeling... Very uncomfortable in my nice clothes. <laughs> and it wasn't it wasn't even that late at this point, right? Because you hadn't been there that long. It was midnightish or something. Okay, yeah. yeah, I, mean, I guess it's still so. yeah, yeah. And uh, so we get to the bus stop, and it's in front of this church or something. And there's a guy sleeping in a sleeping bag up on top of the steps of the church, and there's nobody else in view. And there's barely any street lights, and I'm like holding my light up, trying to look at, this, at my phone up with the light on looking at this the bus schedule i'm like oh shit it's gonna be an hour or more before there's a bus coming here and we're looking around going ah this doesn't feel right so uh, okay. we, i don't think we should hang out here for an hour i don't think we should hang out here for an hour so i i'm, I'm looking at google maps and everything i realize oh shucks there, shucks shucks <laughs> yeah right like a block the other direction from the club was a metro station and uh, it, the metro stopped a ways away from my friend's house. We'd have to walk a ways, but yeah, that's is this all right. Your blooper? This is my blooper. Yeah, because I mean this the whole really long winded blooper. I'm dude. sorry. It's a long <laughs> hey, you knew this You've about my you got in the ball. You've seen my email. This is, yeah, like all of this to say we could have taken the train instead of the fucking yeah. bus. So then we had to we had to walk. <laughs> we, we, we found the biggest thoroughfare we could find that led back in that direction, and we walked along that and. <laughs> Caught the metro back and then had to walk back from the metro station. Um, hopefully, wait, hopefully and she wasn't we got back heels. without getting mugged. There you go. That's the blooper. <laughs> You're supposed to get mugged in a blooper. <laughs> well, wait. First off, did you yeah. see the Oval Office? Yes, that's it. Awesome. It's much smaller than it looks on TV. <laughs> yeah, and hopefully it was Jane wearing heels because that would have been a long walk. I don't recall. I think she Hope- might have been. <laughs> That's yeah, no. I know. I was like, I can, em- I can empathize with long walks. <laughs> I, they wouldn't. Oh, yeah, they wouldn't. Yeah, yeah. They wouldn't have been. They wouldn't have been tall like spiky heels, but yeah, you know, maybe yeah. a bit of a heel. <laughs> no. Yeah. So like, it's a good story. It's just it's a little long. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, I am the, the, D, the DC <laughs> listeners will be able to relate. Yes. yes. Oh right. yeah. Totally. <laughs> and as former DC livers, we understand. Yes. Yep. And so, familiar so, with the metro. Right. So, so you can cut that all out. <laughs> My first time in a swing club, we had to walk through a really sketchy neighborhood and, and almost got mugged, and then we went to the metro station. So there you go. That's the... Yeah. <laughs> almost got mugged? It was a guy sleeping on the church stairs. <laughs> His sleeping bag was very threatening. <laughs> wow. Is, is there anything else that we may have missed? Yeah, I was, I was going to ask that. Yeah, is there anything that you want to make sure that, like, for anybody else who's thinking about doing this at, at your stage in life or at any stage in life, like, any tips or tricks or words of wisdom that you'd like to impart? 
I I would say that the one thing that I that I would like to say is that um I think that the the that we can have romantic partners the way that we have friends. And that we can have like you you nobody says to you you can only have one friend. And that's it for the rest of your life. Pick one. And that's it. You can do that. And especially at our age when things like child rearing, home buying, purchasing, you know, all of that is no longer really an issue, that this is the time then to start thinking about who is it that you, like, what do you want to do? Do you want more than one romantic lover in your life? And if so, you can find those people. You can find them. Mm -hmm. You really can. They exist. I mean, they're few and far between, but the ones who are out there are awesome. And your life can be really, you know, simple in its complexity. I mean, it's just, you know, it's, it's a, a simple, simple choice to make. And it's so rewarding. And especially if you are somebody who, especially as a woman who is just very, at, after being married and having to answer to somebody for God knows how many fucking years, to be able to just say, I'm not answering to anybody but myself anymore. And you men who want to be invited along, come along. Come along with me. Let's all have a great time together. It's going to be like camp. And so, yeah, we, it's, it's totally doable. It's not too late. You just need to find the right people. And it's, you know, if I can do it in the middle of freaking Indiana, <laughs> anybody can do it. Anybody. Yeah. And I, okay. I, I would echo all those sentiments and, uh, and just say that it, it's been really fantastic for me to discover non-monogamy and lose the, the focus on, on, you know, this has to, you, you, when I was younger, it was like, you would meet someone and it was like, Oh, this is the person this I've got to, this has got to work, you know? And if it didn't work out, it would be devastating and so forth. And just to, to discover that, no, if, if you have different goals and it doesn't work out, that's fine. Let go and just, you know, wish them well and then look for someone who does work for you, mm-hmm. who, who will have similar goals to yours. And, and if, you know, as, as you go, you might drift apart and at that point say, realize it and just say, okay, that's all, that's all right. Mm -hmm. It's been great. I've, I've really enjoyed all this. And now you can look for something else and I can look for something else. And that, that, that's just immensely freeing. It, it just gets rid of so much, uh, you know, stress and so forth in your life. Yeah. Just the the pressure of having to be coupled. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, The other thing that I would say is that, and I, I, I think that this is super important, especially for somebody of my age that I've made really good friends, like really amazing, good, non-romantic friends through the dating apps Yeah. that as long as you are, you know, honest, like I remember my first date going out with this guy, he just was like, Hey, basically got on Tinder and was like, Hey, what are you doing tonight? (laughs) You're like really close to me. I'm like, well, I'm not doing anything. And he's like, okay, let's go meet for dinner. And we did. And I told him, you know, I'm not monogamous. And he was like, well, kind of not my thing. And I was like, that's fine. So let's just be friends. Do you know, I was invited to his wedding. The only non-family member, he was my guest, invited to his wedding last year. And I mean, whenever his wife is out of town, she's like, yeah, go hang out with Eliza. Because she trusts me because we're, because I've always been super honest. And, you know, has told her when I first met her, you know, we met going on a date and decided that we were not romantically compatible, but now we're like, and seriously, we talk once a week. I expect my phone call from him every Tuesday night. (laughs) I mean, it's like, and we're dear friends and I've made several really good friends. And so dating apps aren't just for getting laid Mm -hmm. after the age of 50. You can make really, really good friends too. And you know, don't discount that. Yeah. And, yeah. and yeah. those, I've, I've had the same sort of friendships develop with people I've never even met in person mm-hmm. yeah. that I met through the dating apps 
And I, I got involved in Burning Man because of women who I met on OK Cupid who told me about Burning Man. I was like, wow, this is so cool. Yeah. Only one of them have I ever met. And that was like once with a guy she was seeing out in San Francisco. Um, right. So, yeah, it just, it can open up your world so much. It's yeah. amazing. Mm-hmm. Resources, uh, you always, you asked about that? Yeah. Um, there was a great little book called Playing Fair, A Guide to Non-Monogamy for Men into Women by a guy named Pepper Mint, who's, okay. I think, a big big name out in non- polyamory out in, in the, the Bay Area. Sort of uh-huh. So but, I've read it. It's really good. I hate his name. But. <laughs> <laughs> right. um, but yeah, it's fantastic. And I think it would be fantastic for anybody, man or woman, yeah. mo- monogamous or non-monogamous, yeah. you know, it doesn't matter. It, it just is really good advice about how to have a healthy relationship. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Awesome. Cool. Yeah. Thank you for throwing that in there. Yeah. We will put links to that in the show notes. And and thanks for your, I mean, everything that you both shared tonight, because I think a lot of the, the insight into like right at the end there, just like if your goal, yeah, you're getting on a dating site and your goal is to, to meet the one, if that's what you're doing, like, but don't, don't walk through life with blinders on because you don't know who you might be missing uh, by doing that and and you you guys have exemplified that as well in your uh ability and willingness to meet each other's you know your metamorphs and like you wouldn't necessarily think that you would find a close friend in your partner's partners but you've done it and i think that's a great lesson to take away as well so yes. thank you for doing that and yeah. for sharing everything with us and for reaching out in the first place too no, okay. you're very welcome I'm i'm so glad that you decided we were <laughs> Worth uh, interviewing. It's, it's, oh, a, little, yeah. it's in a total gas. To most listeners, I mean, yeah. If you reach out to us and have a compelling story. <laughs> it doesn't have to be a 47 double-sided. <laughs> yeah. He said 150. Yeah. Yeah. That yeah. literally wow. starts with, it was a dark and stormy night. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah. And, it, and it ends on the Metro. The worst novel ever written. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. well, so it's a good, I think it's a good trait because I, I don't know. It's better to share too much than not enough. It's uh, even over communication is better than no communication. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Awesome. Well, maybe with that, we will let you both get into your Sunday evening and we will keep in touch. And uh, thank you again. Yeah. yeah. Thank, you, so thank much. you guys. It's been wonderful. Yes. Lovely. Okay. And we're back. But just, just for a second. I was like, just for a second, you interrupted me. I know. <laughs> but only for a second I interrupted you. Okay, so we recorded the previous interview, um, and then a week later, Mark and Eliza reached out to us and wanted to add a, a more discussion around um, being diagnosed with an STI. So Yeah, so specifically, this conversation is about mostly about HPV. And so HPV is a very tricky one. It's... And there's a lot of different types and there's a lot of different information out there. So we did our best um, to present what we know to be the, the best information or the facts on it. Uh, we, we don't ever claim to be doctors. We don't know everything about it. And Mark and Eliza both did quite a bit of research on it. And so they're speaking from sort of the perspective of recently having been diagnosed and, and doing the tons and tons of research you do when you learn about something that you have. And so we've included a lot of resources in the show notes for you. And we also just wanted to say, like, please do your own research. Talk to your doctor. And we are working on getting some actual medical professionals on the show in the future to uh, help answer some of these questions and get some clarity that that we don't have today. So um, sort of take this conversation and use it as a sort of an example of a firsthand experience of how how to navigate these things and if we misspoke on a number or a fact please just keep in mind that we aren't medical professionals yeah we just try our best and i think this conversation is super valuable because you get to see firsthand or hear firsthand how they handle the situation so i really hope a lot of people get a lot out of this so enjoy and we will see you in a few minutes for the outro yep welcome back 
Like Mark, part two? Part, part 1.5? Yeah, I was yeah, yeah, Mark, yeah. And Eli- Mark and Eliza, we... So, real quick, why, why we're doing this right is uh, we had recorded our the first part of this interview that everybody just listened to uh, probably, what, like a month, month and a half ago. And since that time, um, the episode 78 with uh, Michelle in Orlando aired. And after that, you kind of reached out and said, well... Hey, they shared some information about uh, some STI testing and testing results that they got in their experience. And also after our discussion, you had an experience that you thought would be beneficial. And so you reached back out. So we're super, super grateful that you did that. And and we really appreciate it. And we're happy to have you both back on again. This is hilarious to me, though, because when he forwarded the email that he sent to you, I was like, what the hell are you doing? Like, they don't care. (laughs) <laughs> like, we care about everybody here? of course we care <laughs> they're not your medical providers like oh my god so then he well, said he checked with you to see if it was as weird as i felt like it was and he was like no no they were totally cool about it i was like all right <laughs> well, I, don't, I don't know what that says about us but <laughs> <laughs> i think it speaks very so, highly of you because i would have been like well, do you really think i care What's well, me? so maybe we should clue everybody in, I guess, on your end, Mark. Do you mind sharing what sort of what happened since last time we talked? And yeah. Okay. So, um, well, about a week after we had our interview, um, I went into the doctor because several months earlier, I had gone in to see a nurse practitioner at a, a clinic that my uh, employer has because I had some little things that looked like razor bumps down at the base of my penis. And I was a little concerned. I thought they might be genital warts or molluscum, and I wanted to check it out. She looked at him and said, nah, nah, just razor bumps. Don't worry about it. And then after our interview, I suddenly was looking at that one day and went, wait a minute, those are still there. And that doesn't seem right. So I went back in, got a appointment with my actual doctor and he took one look at it and said, oh, yeah, that's general warts. So I uh, immediately was ticked off at the nurse practitioner <laughs> and misdiagnosed it. Um, and because there, you said there were a few months in between there. Right? Yeah, there's yeah. a few months in between there. And, you know, we're having sex and yeah. other people. Yeah, right. So that's when I reached out to you and said, hey, shall we talk about this a little bit? And since then... Eliza and I did some uh, research to make sure that we're going to be giving some good information and not just passing along more sort of urban myths and, and uh, uh, bad stuff. So, yeah, well, I'm, I'm curious then, like, so two things, and maybe a question directed at each of you. So first of all, you got this news and then you had to share it with Eliza mm-hmm. and potentially other partners. Yep. And then second on Eliza's side, like, how did you receive that? And like, I'm going to, I'm going to interrupt you for just a second. I don't do this very often, yeah, but, but it's, it's inappropriate when you do, <laughs> so, but, you, but you said genital warts. And I just want to be clear that there are different, um, viruses that can cause different types of warts. So I yep. wanted to see if you could expand on that diagnosis first yeah, and then answer sure. Finn's question. Fair point. Let's get the, let's get the first, the facts out of the way. Okay. So here's the facts. Uh, as I have learned from doing some research here, well, first off, I kind of knew this, but uh, they're really, really common. It, something like 80% roughly of people who are sexually active in their life are going to get infected with HP, some form of HPV, human papillomavirus, at some point in their life. Right. And not all of them, though, will give you warts. Yeah. Some of them you don't, you nothing. Yeah. Nothing. Right. You're infected, but you don't know it. Nothing. There's no yeah. visible sign. Right. And there's no um, test. Yeah. For any of those. And there's a whole lot of different variety, you know, strains that cause genital warts uh, and strains that cause warts on fingers and feet and, you know, other parts of your body don't cause genital warts. So you can't get it from like having a wart on your finger and jerking somebody off. Or like having a foot fetish. Yes. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so I have, I, I've got visible warts and there are two strains which cause something like 80 or 90% of the visible genital warts. So it's probably one of those two strains. Don't know, but I mean, there's a bunch of other strains that can cause visible warts. 
but they account for just a small proportion of the cases that are found. Right. Um, okay. And the people think about HPV and, and STIs in you know as co- potentially causing cancer, HPV causing cancer mm-hmm. of the ovaries or oropharyngeal, you know, in your throat. There are two main strains that cause that can cause cancer, and those do not generally cause visible warts. They right. have, I think, they have been associated, found in some in some warts, but they're not really thought to cause the visible warts. So, if you have visible warts, as I do, it's probably not one of the cancer causing right. varieties. Right, which is super important, and which I did not know. Yeah, at I first. didn't know yeah. that either. Um, so. To your question, I was I was on like a superstar rock star weekend with a friend of mine, and I get a call from Mark, which I'm not used to at all. So I was like, "Oh, what is going on?" He was like, "Can you can we please talk?" And normally he would never yeah, ever. We just text all yeah. the time. We never talk. And especially in a situation like that, when he knew like I was going to go see Earth, Wind, and Fire in a private box, and then go out yachting the next day, and you know, <laughs> so he knew I was not going to be like, "Hey, what's up?" So he, I was like, "Okay," thinking that like maybe some he'd had a death in the family or something, and so he called me and said, "I just want you to know that this." that I have genital warts. And I was like, is that, is that all? Because you <laughs> freaked me out. Now, here's the thing that I do know. Be, my, I have, um, my ex-husband had throat cancer that was HPV positive. Um, I also have an ex-lover who got the same thing. So at this point, I'm feeling like typhoid Mary, right? <laughs> I mean, I'm like everybody. But I was told... Um, by the doctor, by my ex-husband's oncologist. I mean, because I was like, well, I've been tested for HPV when I have my pap smears, and I'm not positive for it, so what the hell is going on here? How did you... And that doctor actually pulled me aside after our first meeting with him and said, look, I, I know you're probably thinking that something terrible is going on in your husband's... He's probably messing around with it, but you can have that in most cases of cancer, it lies dormant and just sticks to one piece of DNA and changes it over the course of like 20 to 25 years. So it probably was something that happened many, many years ago. And I was like, okay, so I don't have to kill him. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. So I knew that. I did know that, that I knew that it was not probably something that I had given him. I could have. Who knows? But my big fear was we need to look, make sure, you know, you get screened for the cancer now. So, right. and that's when we learned that the wart causing variety is not the same as the cancer causing variety, which is a huge, which is the only thing that I would worry about. Yeah. You know, I was also told by that doctor, nearly everybody who's sexually active has HPV in some way, shape or form. Most people just shed it. Most people, and there's no sign of it afterwards. You can't, even if you're tested for it, there's no sign that you did have it at one point. Um, so there, it's just such a, so many moving parts. And that's what worried me was that it would be cancer causing. And, um, th- it was a relief to know that that was not the case. Yeah. 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 Now the, the, the bummer part of it was that, uh, warts can be hard to get rid of, you know, with treatment. And I mean, I've, I've had warts on, you know, fingers and feet before, and even with freezing treatments, they just came right back. And, it, you know, I had them for years. And then, then your body, typically most people's body, if they are have normal immune systems, will eventually wake up and go, oh, there's a virus here. And they'll clear the virus. Typically, they say in two years, but I've had ones on fingers or feet that lasted well, you know, longer yeah. than that. So I'm sitting there going, oh, fuck, I'm going <laughs> to... I may I may not be having sex for you know several years here. This mm-hmm. could this could really put a crimp crimp in my uh, love life. Right, and because because you're obviously more likely. I don't have to... that much left, so <laughs> <laughs> because you're obviously more likely to to spread it when you have the wart showing. So that's yeah, what yeah. you're saying is that if you if you you want to not have sex at the risk of. Um, you know, not because you don't want to spread it because you yeah. can't, like you said, you can't use a condom to cover them. Right. Up. Cause it was right at the base, right at the yeah. joint with my body and a little bit on the body, a little bit on the penis. And, and so there's no way you're going to cover that with a condom. So no. right. it, it, to avoid 
causing problems for partners, uh, I would pretty much have to not have sex. However, spoiler, there's a happy ending, I think, on this because... Well, you didn't have the cancer-causing strain, strain yes. with, that you know of, so that's a that's a happy that's, ending. That's, and a then, big, that's a big happy yeah. ending. Yep. Um, it doesn't. It doesn't. And it doesn't appear that you've spread it to any any of your, your partners that you know as of. As far right? as I know, no, no. I I have no symptoms. Listen, here's the thing: if it has happened, it can take twenty years for even worse to show up. So there's exactly. no point to know at all. Except. Uh, yeah. uh, Typically, I think the genital, the visible warts will develop in four weeks to eight months yes. or so. But it can also yeah. lie dormant for years before yeah. it pops out. So, so I mean, you, yeah. you don't really just know. know. And so that's why even it, like you just said, oh, you know, you're afraid of spreading them because we are spreading it without anyway. knowing whether yeah. we have it or not all the time. Yeah. This man is such a condom user. I mean, I have never, he's like militant about it, which is super healthy and great. And so I'm shocked, quite frankly, but <laughs> this could have been something that happened many, many years ago. We, yeah. I mean, there's well, just no way to know. But also, I mean, it, it's in a place that isn't covered by the condom. Right. So even if I was using a condom, that's not right. going to stop it. There's just no way it, to this know. This would have occurred. Yeah. Um, and it, it seems that warts are not super easy to spread despite the fact that so many people have them i found a bit of research when i was looking up all this where someone did a study they looked at i don't know somewhere between one and 200 i think couples college age couples where one of the partners had warts and the other one didn't and they followed them for like six months and in that six months only 20%, so one in five of the couples transferred the warts to the partner that didn't have them. And that was people who were having sex on an average four times a month, yeah. four times a week, mm -hmm. and half of them weren't using condoms. So one in five in six months with relatively little, you know, uh, precautions. So it, but on the other hand, if it can take up to eight months to show up, right. maybe more of them did spread it, but it just right. hadn't shown up yet. Who right. knows? Right. Or maybe it's never going to show up at all. Yeah. I mean, it that's, it's like HPV is cuckoo that way. There are so many different yeah. strains of it that you don't know. You don't know. Yeah. You know, you just don't know. Yeah. Right. But so, I mean, so you can't just, here's the other thing you can, you can just, you know, you can fuck with the condom on thinking that you're, but if you're going to give somebody a blowjob without a condom, mm. you're exposing yourself to it. Yeah. And general wart strains can infect you in the mucous, mucous right. That's membranes how of your mouth the men and throat. Get it in their throats is by going down on women who yep. have the virus. So it's it's one of the main yeah. main factors in in uh, throat cancer for men is mm -hmm. HPV infection. Yeah. Right. And so then let's talk about then about getting um, oh vaccinated. Vaccinated, yes. Uh, so my daughter actually. Uh, her pediatrician was way ahead of her time. And when my daughter was 11, she said, this new thing has just come out and it's called Gardasil. And I was like, yes, yes, I've read about it. Let's do it. So she was on the very first version of Gardasil. Um, and then yeah, nobody Which... ever talked about getting their sons vaccinated. And then when, after my uh, now ex-husband got cancer, that oncologist pulled me aside and said, if you have a son, have your kids gotten vaccinated? And I said, yeah, my daughter didn't. He said, this is what's going to happen if your son doesn't get vaccinated. This could very well happen to him as well. And as much as I now dislike that man, that was the most horrific thing to have to go through. Half of those people never actually end up like learning how to chew and swallow again. And they're on a feeding tube for the rest of their lives. If they yeah. get cured. Your, your, ex, your ex-husband, not yes. the doctor. <laughs> yes, no. But so the, so the doctor said, get your son vaccinated too. So then he was on the next version of it, which was just two shots. Um, and I think that it's super, super important. You do not want to see your, your son go through what my ex-husband went through. Yeah. Both. It was, I mean, crazy. Three forms of radiation every single day, every other week. Um, like three different forms of chemotherapy all day, round the clock, every other week for a full week. And then he'd be off for a week. He was bald and skinny and constipated from the pain medication. I mean, it was just hell. He had to force himself to eat and it was painful to swallow. And, you know, he was 
a trooper through it all. He really was. He just made himself do it. But so many other people didn't. And it's not something you would want anybody, even your worst enemy to go through. So I do say, get your sons and daughters vaccinated, get them vaccinated, period. And both, both my kids have been vaccinated fully. And, uh, I might want to go back and see when it was done because, uh, the original Gardasil only covered the two cancer ca- main cancer-causing mm-hmm. strains. And then they came up with the second version, which covered four strains, I think, that included the two main wart-causing ones. And the current version of Gardasil covers nine strains. So... So, I mean, I guess, you know, one thing, come, circling back... Yeah. Circling back to the sort of what you went through, Mark, which is, right... Putting aside the the potential that that HPV can lead to certain types of cancers, right? Yeah. In in your case, and this is much what we heard when we talked with Michelle in Orlando, mm-hmm. that they had basically no symptoms, right? You had symptoms, but you said like you went in, you had them looked at, yeah. and then it was weeks or months later where you're like, oh, I guess those are still like so. It's not to, like it was painful right. or itchy no, or anything. No, not exactly, painful, just, not really very yeah. noticeable. They were just like, literally, like they looked like razor bumps, but not even red. They were just kind of like flesh colored. And then there, but there was a cluster of three or four of them that started getting a little, you know, kind of grouping together and getting bigger. And I was like, that eh, doesn't look like razor bump. And they shouldn't be here after this amount of time anyway. Yeah. Even, right. You know, even and if so, I'm c- continually guess, re- re-irritating them, they shouldn't be there. Right. And I think where my, my point was like the like the impact on your life at like in terms of being a healthy human, like yeah, it was, it was no. negligible. Yeah. Right? No, no impact whatsoever. Yeah. The only right. impact is not wanting to spread this inconvenience to other people. Mm-hmm. Um, but as far as actual, you know, it, disrupting my life, nothing. Now I've, I understand from, from the research I've done, I understand some people can get really big warts from this. But in my case, it was nothing like that. And I got derailed a bit there, but there is seems to be a happy ending to this in that my doctor, one of the possible treatments was something called imiquimod 5% cream. It's, uh, it's something that it's, it's not, not exactly an antiviral, but it activates like tumor necrosis factors and various other parts of your immune system. And it uh, gets them to notice the warts, apparently. And uh, looking at research on this, I found one study where uh, they took a bunch of people, treated them with this cream, and about 50% of them had total clearing of the warts within four months of using the, you know, using the cream for four months, cleared it for 50% of the people. And having used it now for, what, a couple months or a month and a half or whatever. Um, Has it been that long? Really? Well, at least over a month. Yeah. But from about a week after our interview, whenever that yeah. was. Mm-hmm. Um, that uh, it seems to be working for me. Yeah. They're They're shrinking the big group has gone away completely the little ones are looking like they're under attack and shrinking and so uh i'm hoping that within a month or so i'll be all clear awesome i thought you were going to say that the one of the side effects of the cream is a major penis bigger but i suppose (laughs) i I suppose that's good news as well that the the warts are going away (laughs) it all swelled up down there (laughs) (laughs) no that's awesome that's wonderful that it's working and yeah um yeah that it you haven't it sounds like well it's a it is a minor inconvenience you haven't let this ruined anything no 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 ruin anything well and, 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 i mean i'm, I'm not gonna call it ruining <laughs> but i do miss having penetrative sex yes. yeah you know with this one um so that so it's not ruining it's just you know you yeah. get a little creative it's, it's... and other it's shrunk shrunk the menu a bit. Yeah, yeah, yes, yeah. yes. But it's but just think about that build up for. And that's so true, right? I yes. seriously, right. it'll be yep. like, ooh, Woo-hoo. like I'm a virgin again, <laughs> at the age of fifty four. Yes. <laughs> well, I think it's I think it's it's super awesome that that you came on and we're willing to share that because obviously not something that's super easy to talk about, but yeah, even even more fantastic is like hearing it from 
one of your partner sides is that like her response was first of all is is that all and second of all like <laughs> let's Why make sure it's not going to cause something worse yeah yeah than than this and like it's just a minor inconvenience and now you'll you'll carry on and and yeah. it'll be great in a month Yep. Yeah, I think that one of the reasons that we wanted to come back on, and believe me, I was like, I, why are you even telling people this? <laughs> uh, but I think one of the reasons that I want that when he said, should we go back on? And I was like, yes, was because it should be normalized. Yeah. I mean, it should not be like this big this this thing has horrifying thing that changes your sex life forever. You know, you get the cream, you use some condoms, you just be careful for a while and, you know, whatever. Like 80% of the people that you see out at night at a club or whatever have this. Well, no, have had it at some point in their life or, right. will, or will have it right. at some point. But I mean, that is, it's, it's so normal that to, that it should, that the stigma, any stigma that should, that is attached to it should not exist Yeah. because it's just a, you know, it's, it's an in, minor inconvenience yeah. is the worst. Yeah, yeah. Just one other thing I wanted to get in before we, we uh, finish up. Yeah. Which, of uh, course came out of the the research we did was that uh, I did see that any sort of little tear or abrasion in your skin can make it easier to pick up warts. And even that, that applies to shaving or waxing. Uh, so my takeaway from that is probably if you're going to, you know, be shaving or waxing, you might want to do it like a day or two before you're going to go to a big party or something. <laughs> give, it a, give, it, give it a chance to heal up because it, it's, it's the, the rapidly dividing cells where it's healing that, that can pick up the virus more easily. Suck it right in. Yeah. Yeah. Huh. yeah. Solid um, advice. Yeah, no, that's yep. really good advice. So here's the uh, one more thing that I wanted to mention is that now this guy is planning on getting Gardas Hill at mm. his age, which I totally am like, why, why, why? Because even if you get the cancer causing form of it at this age, now I've learned this now since our initial conversation where I was worried about the cancer, it's going to take 20 years to develop and you'll be like 80 years old. And you know, if my dad's ninety four. Oh, whatever. And doing great. He, I'm, I'm, so I'm, I'm, just I'm going for like, one hundred and twenty minimum. You, but, but the chances <laughs> of you already having those types of um, HPV are probably good. I don't know. You know. See, so yeah. Prior, so it's going to cost almost well, a thousand dollars. I'm on team. I'm on team Mark here. Well, at the yeah. same time, I was like, "What? What is the? I guess the cost of the vaccine? Right. So the, the cost, the seven hundred bucks. Yeah, it's yeah. it's, it's going to be close to seven hundred bucks. Um, so yeah, I'm not cheap. It's not cheap. So I'm 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 using my company's uh, medical, you yeah, know, well, flexible spending yeah. plan thing to put away money <laughs> a little bit from each paycheck next year pre tax. So I save a little bit that way. Yeah, and I'll pay for it out of pocket. Because well, because I'm too a, old I'm too old for insurance to pay for it. So this is why they tell you to get your kids vaccinated, yes. but at eleven is when they're saying mm -hmm. that's kind of like the age yeah, before they can get yeah before they're sexually thing. active, um, right? And I'm like, you way too late for you. <laughs> well, <laughs> but I, I think the, the, <laughs> just to throw this out there in terms of what the the new age limit I think they upped it last year, and I believe it is. 46 yeah. is the, is the new limit. Oh, for it's, real? It's See, gone, I did not know that Yeah, it, I, I knew it was up in the 40s. It's gone up quite a bit, and both men and yeah. women. Um, yeah, because so, I, I got it in college, so I was in my early 20s. Right. And back then, the age limit wasn't very high. Yeah. yeah. Um, they've kept increasing it. You might, you should, you should probably... You should probably look into getting revaccinated with the new version, because you, yes. would, you, would, have not, you would not be covered for as many strains... If you were... Yes, I'm realizing that as I'm talking to you. So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I may talk to my kids about that as well. Yeah. yeah. We we learn a lot too from this. Yeah. So I think, yeah, yeah, I mean, thank you both again for coming on the first time and for coming back on this time. And um we just we really appreciate it. Mm -hmm. It's our really pleasure. Yeah, we appreciate being yeah, I appreciate we, you not thinking he's crazy. <laughs> no, like, at least not about she does. <laughs> like I do. I'm like, oh my god. Um, I I really do think though that yeah, that that everybody just needs to like. A lot of STIs are not going to be anything other than 
the the biggest problem is going to be the stigma attached to them as opposed to actual medical problems and all of that. I think that you, no matter what, you protect yourself um, because you just don't want even a minor inconvenience. You don't want it, you know, something that's going to be with you for the rest of your life. But it's also something that I think people have got to start talking about as a normal, everyday thing with sexually active adults. Yep. Mm-hmm. Right. Because it we, happens. It yep. happens all the time. Yep. All yeah. the time. And that's that's one thing I really appreciate about your podcast is that you you bring that up. You yeah. know, and you talk to people about that because that helps. You're you're not you're not only normalizing non monogamy, you're normalizing yeah. you know rational discussions about STIs. Two birds, one stone. Yeah. Yep. Yay! <laughs> that's perfect. Well and and I was gonna say too, like we've had some requests, we've gotten emails from listeners that say we would like to hear stories of people actually handing a diagnosis hand, handling a diagnosis oh, of an yes. STI. So I'm so appreciative Which that you're granted. willing to come on and share because that's oh my gosh, people okay. want to hear that. Okay, yeah. good. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. Yeah. And uh and thank you both again. And thank you again, you know, we can't put the information out there if you're not willing to share it. So yeah. Kudos exactly to right. you both and and, and, and now we'll what. look all all of us will look further into the Gardasil vaccine. Yes. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Because I had no idea about the age thing. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah. Okay. So, well, thank you again. Is there any last minute things or, um, okay. I don't think so. I just wish I could have been at that phone party. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hey, there, there'll be more. Yeah. We're back again. Again. The last time for this episode. Yep. Sorry. I didn't <laughs> want to interrupt you and get scolded again. <laughs> I'm used to you interrupting. So now I, uh, leave space for you to interrupt. Well, if you left space to begin with, I wouldn't have to interrupt. Yeah. I do. That's what I was just saying. So one thing we wanted to say again, as always, thank you, Eliza and Mark, for coming back on, sharing a super amazing story and a vulnerable story. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Yes. And we couldn't. Yeah. And also just thank you again for coming back on and sharing the addendum to the show. So um, I think it was wonderful and I really appreciate that you two were willing to talk about something that was maybe a little bit vulnerable. So, and while we're while we're on the topic of STIs, maybe it would be a good time to remind people that if they wanted to, they could save ten dollars off of one condoms or my or ten percent. What am I talking about? Ten percent <laughs> off my one condoms or one condoms using the offer code Emma, and. It's not even necessarily an affiliate. It's just they partnered with us to give you guys 10% off. Yes. All information on our resources page under our website, which is normalizingnonmonogamy.com. And keep in mind, I do understand that in this case, specifically, condoms wouldn't necessarily help, but they do help protect you from a lot of other STIs. That's true. Yes. And the last thing I wanted to quickly mention was a um, note about a number that did get mentioned that I did know for a fact was not true. I mentioned that the new age for the uh, age limit for Gardasil was 46. It is actually 45. My apologies. But also... (laughs) How dare you get that wrong? (laughs) Keep in mind that your insurance company may not cover it until that point. Yeah. Not that I have personal experience dealing with this bullshit, but (laughs) just saying... It may be something you come across. Yes. So talk to your doctor and also your insurance companies um, before trying to get the Gardasil vaccine. But I do highly recommend and, that you get it. And shopping around. We've heard that depending on where you get it, it can be cheaper. Yes, so yes. Do do a little comparison shopping. Okay. Next week, normal Wednesday episode, it will be Chloe and Drew. Right? It will be. That's true. Yeah. Unless we decide to surprise you on Monday. That's true. We probably won't, though. (laughs) But I'm not going to tell much about their story. Super fun people. And uh, you'll just have to wait till next week. All right. Let's go get tested and let's go to New York City. Okay. Bye, everyone. Here we come. Thanks for listening.